Hello and welcome to the Comfort Care Expert podcast for nurses, where nurses can be informed, empowered, and prepared to practice palliative care. And specifically, what we're going to be talking about is comfort care, so care to those at end of life. And I'm one of your hosts, Megan Lifto. I'm a palliative care clinical nurse specialist, and I am joined with Elena Prendergast, who is a palliative care nurse practitioner. And what we're going to be talking about today is this comfort care tool. Whoops, it's not showing up on the screen. <laughs> we're going to be talking about a comfort care tool. But before we do that, since it is our first episode, we thought we would give introductions. So I guess I will start first. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm like Elena, I'm a second career nurse. I used to teach college biology and anatomy and physiology. I always thought about being a nurse, but both my mom and sister are nurses and I wanted to be different than them. I wanted to find my own path. However, once um, cancer had struck my family and seeing the work of the oncology nurses, oh, I just felt called um, to want to become an oncology nurse. So I went to the University of Minnesota earned my RN degree and was working as an oncology nurse at a large metro hospital in Minneapolis. And it was there on this unit. It was an oncology unit. And we also took care of the comfort care patients. So patients that were on life support, um, once they that was discontinued to allow them to have a natural death, they would come to our unit where some would discharge home with hospice, but I feel like most of them, they died on our unit. And that's really where I felt that calling. I've just felt so comfortable and really um, saw the need of supporting the family. Um, and so that's what prompted me to go back and earn my doctor of nursing practice with a specialty in palliative care. And it really has become my life's work and I'm very passionate about this. So why don't you share about yourself, Elena, and what made you become a nurse? Oh, thank you, Megan, for sharing your story. Um, as you said previously, I too am a second career nurse, um, actually coming in later in life. I started nursing school when I was 40. Um, some of that was my own doing, um, and then some of it was because I let the powers of somebody's words um, take hold of me. So in seventh grade, my uh, science teacher said, I hope you don't go into science because you'll starve. Uh -huh. And so I let those words kind of, you know, stew for the next 30 years, probably. I mean, close. Um, my mother always wanted me to be a nurse, ironically. She always said, you'd be a great nurse. And I just ran and ran and ran away from it. Well, unfortunately, after a series of personal losses, um, including my mother, um, I finally made that decision to go into nursing. I got my ADM in nursing from the Daytona State uh, College in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I embarked on a career here in Georgia uh, right after graduation. And I went into the critical care environment. Um, and I, you know, I think I was a good nurse, I guess. Um, but I can't honestly say it was my passion because just like you, what I saw was a lot of patients that were coming to us and they were dying right away. And I didn't exactly know what to do with that, but I did know that I loved caring for those patients at end of life and giving them just the dignity that they deserved. So I thought that leaving the critical care environment and going to hospice would be the answer. Unfortunately, um, once again, I saw patients dying right away. And I started to ask the question, is there anything between do everything and hospice? And that's when I discovered this concept called palliative care. And I embarked on a career that included uh, working at an FQHC, interventional radiology, med surge, just a lot of areas where I feel like I got a very well-rounded view of our healthcare system. But what I did not see was any change or anybody really doing what I felt palliative care should be. So um, like you, I fell in love with palliative care as a specialty went on to get additional education. I got my MSN and my DNP from Frontier Nursing University. And it really, um, like you, has become my life's mission uh, to make sure that people understand, truly understand um, how great palliative care can be when done properly. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Elena. And something else, another similarity between the two of us is we both have started our own businesses as well. Um, I started Comfort Care Expert LLC in 2020 based on this need that the nurses in the hospital setting where I had worked as a palliative care advanced practice nurse, they didn't know how to take care of these comfort care patients. They didn't understand the orders. They didn't know what they could do without an order. Um, And so I was doing so much coaching and I kept thinking, okay, if this is happening here at this hospital, what's happening in rural areas or what's happening down in the South where they don't have access to palliative care um, providers as much to have it be a personal coach. Um, And so I, the vision of comfort care expert is that every nurse will have the skills and knowledge to practice palliative care with their patients with a serious illness. Because I would always tell the bedside nurses, you don't need a graduate degree to do this. A lot of palliative care is just communication, right? It's really informing people um, and providing that comfort and connecting with them. And so I was very much um, an advocate to try and get them all to get comfortable with, with palliative care. Um, And so if you don't mind, what is is sharing a little bit about your business, Elena? I love that you use the two things that I'm passionate about, and that is education and advocacy. Um, I started Tree of Life uh, to ensure that all clients with serious um, and life-limiting diagnosis are empowered to define and achieve optimal quality of life through independent, individualized support, education, and advocacy. So simply put, uh, the goal is to enhance quality of life through education, support, and advocacy. And that all stems, just like you said, from being on the floors, um, being in the community, and realizing that um, I agree with you, and I do a lot of education on, on the academia, and I do work on the floor do um, helping with education. But where I've found is that we're missing the mark in the community. Um, in advocating directly to our patients and their families. Um, As you noted, there's so much confusion that it doesn't get to them. And so I'm really passionate lately in this stage of my career and my business and ensuring that the patients, you know, the clients, so to speak, is the one that's getting the information that is most valuable to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And before we share the comfort care tool with all of you, we need to give a background of it because it was not us that created this tool. So the comfort care tool was previously called the CARES tool, which is the acronym for care, comfort, airway, restlessness, emotional support, spiritual support, and then lastly, self-care. This model was created by Dr. Bonnie Freeman. It was part of her DNP work that she created this pocket-sized guide that nurses could have with them so that they knew, oh, here's what I can do to help provide comfort or to help with the airway or restlessness. Um, And so unfortunately, she, I should mention, she even wrote um, a book called Compassionate Person-Centered Care for the Dying. So she was very passionate about the CARES tool. She um, wrote a book about it. It was published in the May 2013 edition of the Journal of Hospice and Palliative Nursing. And I think it was the most downloaded article of that year, just to show that people really do want to learn how to provide care um, to those at end of life. Um, And she even was in the middle of making a movie when sadly she died from cancer. And so Elena and I, we are carrying on her legacy and we renamed the tool comfort care tool with permission of Dr. Betty Farrell. Um, We renamed it to show that this is a tool specifically for nurses to use when they're caring for comfort care patients. So these are patients with a terminal illness. Um, And so do, 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 do. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So just to reflect the purpose of it and the type of patients, that's why we renamed it to the comfort care tool. All right. And to ha- to get access to your own comfort care tool, you can go to my website to download it. It's comfortcareexpert.com. And I'm going to start out with the focus of comfort, which is the first, um, yeah, which is the first big component of this. I'm trying to see if there's a way No. Well, here's, I mean, it's the biggest section on this tool because then we got a little bit of airway and then on the back, there's three more sections, but comfort, comfort takes up the largest 
part of the tool. And that's because comfort is so paramount. And it's not just keeping somebody comfortable, but also their whole environment so that they are at ease so that there's, um, you know, a nice, calm and supportive, supportive environment. Um, and it's addressing pain management. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about pain management in our next episode, because it is very important to how do you assess someone's pain once they're like minimally responsive, because it's important to continue to um, keep providing them with pain medication. Um, and I also too, anytime you reposition somebody help with the linens, I mean, it feels so good to flip that pillow. So anytime I would go in, you know, every two hours you go in and you can just do micro turns. You don't need to do the big aggressive, you know, side to side turns that you're used to doing with your hospital patients, just little micro shifts, um, can provide so much. Um, and then Elena, did you have more to share about the comfort aspect? Absolutely. Um, one of the things I want to add is that you understand that comfort care is about addressing the individual and unique um, needs and preferences of the patient. Um, and let's not forget that we do include the family um, in a unit when we're talking about end of life. So we have to remember that we're simultaneously balancing. Obviously, the patient is the priority, but their their family is also important. Yes. Um, and so like you, I agree that it does include effective pain and symptom management. And um, all of this is done to provide them with dignity and respect. Um, and then most of all, we have to align this with their wishes. It can't be what we think is most important. It's what they think is most important. Mm -hmm. And that's why with the title of her book, person-centered care, because what one person likes or what provides them comfort, somebody else wouldn't like there's some people who, when they're laying in bed, they want to have, you know, socks on their feet. They want to feel the blanket snug around them. And then there's other people who are like, nope, I don't want socks on my feet. I want the blankets loose. So it's, um, yeah, it very much is individualized. And also too, just going back to creating that environment, but showing empathy and being compassionate, just having a compassionate presence is so, is so key. So you can learn, um, about, you know, ab about that person and their family and what you can do to, to help keep them comfortable and at ease. And then the second, then the second piece of the tool, it's airway and and that's because people, as they're dying, they're going to have changes in how they're breathing. The breathing pattern changes as it goes from, you know, their, their, I was going to say it goes from their conscious, like you're breathing normally to subconscious. So once somebody does um, become minimally responsive, you're going to notice breathing patterns while they'll have long gaps. So they'll have periods of apnea. Um, and also too, I've noticed where they can, they start breathing more with the mouth like doing kind of guppy breathing once they get closer to um, being at the end of life. But it's important with airway to make sure, because I, I heard a statistic, it's like 80% of people at end of life are going to feel that shortness of breath. But if you look at the top, you know, reasons how people die, heart disease is up there. And a lot of people with heart failure, they have extra fluid in their body. So then they have fluid in their lungs. So then it can help. Um, so we can help them by, um, providing opiates. So opiates are the gold standard of care for shortness of breath, um, as well as using a fan. We have receptors on our face that just by blowing a cool air, it can help somebody, um, with not feeling as short of breath. And then the other concern or the other thing to look out for under the airway is copious secretions. So as people are losing their ability to swallow, because it's something that we keep making saliva, that the saliva can pool in the back of the throat. And so there are some medications that can be helpful for drying up the secretions, but really repositioning could be the best thing just by kind of turning them to help it drain. Um, do you have anything? Oh, and I guess I should mention about the opiates, why opiates are the gold standard of care. Um, opiates are the gold standard because opiates cause vasodilation. So now the blood vessels that are in the lungs, they're wider. So it's going to allow more blood to get to the lungs. And that means more red blood cells available to pick up the oxygen. So then that's why um, they are the gold standard for, um, for shortness of breath or dyspnea. 
I, I agree with you. Um, and one of the struggles that I, I I'm sure you agree that nurses struggle with is giving opioids um, at end of life, especially when we're telling them they're for breathing. And so I'm sure in future podcasts, we'll discuss that a little more. Um, but I, just to reiterate what you're saying, we focus on ensuring that the individual can breathe um, comfortably, um, providing the necessary interventions, pharmacological and non-pharmacological. And you named some ex excellent ones, you know, using opioids, um, fans, um, turning. One of the things that nurses really want to do that really is not best practice at all and does not alleviate um, the struggle to breathe is suctioning. If you're doing that oral suctioning, that's one thing, but deep suctioning is definitely not something that would be removing those um, secretions. It's best to lift the head of the bed or to reposition the patient on their side. Oh, thank you so much for bringing up the suctioning because that was something I, yeah, an experience I had. I even provided education to the respiratory therapist, to the charge nurse, to the person's nurse, just about how it can cause trauma, but it, it can even stimulate more secretions to get <laughs> to get released. Um, and unfortunately, yeah. my patients still they did still did the deep suction. So it was just so frustrating. And that's why education is so important. And that is why we're here doing this. So yeah, thank you so much for yeah, it is one thing if you can see it if they have saliva in their mouth, but most of the time it's um yeah, doing the gentle repositioning. And then so it's clear that airway contributes significantly to a person's overall comfort um, and well-being. But let's move on to another vital aspect of the comfort care tool, and that's restlessness. And it's not uncommon because restlessness, agitation, anxiety has so many different causes. And so trying to figure out what is, you know, are they having emotional distress or is it that um, a common one that I see I'm also a hospice nurse, is constipation. So if somebody has to go, they can just feel the discomfort. So then that's why they can get restless, agitated. Um, so it's important to assess, see if there's stool. Same thing with a full bladder. I mean, it can be, um, gosh, you know, they might need to be have a straight cath or to have a Foley catheter placed because unfortunately opiates and other medications can cause urine retention. So it's important to assess for that. Um, but it's, and also to medication side effects. I mean, something, I know a lot of people, um, you want to give Ativan, but Ativan is really for those that are imminently dying because it can cause hiccups. It can cause other side effects that would cause somebody to be restless. Great. Um, that's actually, you know, we, we need to always go back to evidence, just like we said, um, and we need to stay on top of the evidence and not do the things that we've always done. Uh, restlessness can be distressing, um, not just for the patient, but, you know, for the caregivers as well. When they're watching their loved ones uh, be restless and uncomfortable, that, they, that brings up their anxiety. Oh, yes. Um, so that's why we have to work on addressing those underlying causes that are causing that discomfort. I love that you brought up constipation. Um, most people, you know, some people may have struggled with this, but some people may not have, and they don't realize the goal of, you know, elimination is to relieve our body of toxins. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to the discomfort of it, you know, sitting in, in your gut, um, there's also that discomfort from the toxins that are building up in your system. Um, so, you know, I agree with you using um, things that would help eliminate um, some waste, um, but uh, uh, doing a good assessment and recognizing that our gut shuts down at end of life and constipation may be a normal part of that dying process. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we have to do good assessments. But either way, regardless of what the underlying issue is, calming techniques uh, such as companionship, um, the appropriate medication, they're all going to play a role in relieving the symptoms. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you that good assessment techniques are vital. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. And just understanding and alleviating restlessness can significantly enhance somebody's physical well-being, overall sense. Um, 
And so let's explore now the spiritual and emotional support needs because care, comfort care goes beyond the physical body. I always say um, it's a lot of internal work. I mean, somebody is getting ready to have their soul or their spirit, you know, move on to, you know, kind of shedding that physical body. Um, And so it very much emotional and spiritual support are needed. And you were going to talk about that that aspect yeah that's I, I love this is kind of I, I hate to say my favorite part but I think this is the part where nurses are amazing um because we are biopsychosocial beings and I think that the strengths of nursing is that we um from the very beginning of not in nursing school have been taught you know when you're a brand new nurse you can't write orders or anything like that but what you can provide is a more emotional and spiritual support to your your patients and how you communicate with them it's about addressing those inner needs um it's about connecting them with their faith and sometimes I, i'm sure you've heard you know where they say um ira Bayak said you know there's three things we need to do uh, forgive others forgive ourselves and then say i love you Yep. And I think those are simple things that we can do to help somebody with that process of dealing with, because sometimes people struggle not just with physical pain, but emotional and spiritual pain. Uh, so this is really an aspect of comfort care that helps them find peace and meaning on this you know, end of life journey that they're on. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of support, the last section is what we're going to talk about now, which is self-care and that in itself, in order to keep doing this work in order to, um, yeah, be able to provide to others. I, I think back to the flight attendants, how they talk about put the oxygen mask on yourself first, because you're not going to be able to provide, um, care to others if you're not caring for, for yourself. Um, you know, it's just essential to prioritize your own well being as well. Burnout and caregiver burnout is very real. Um, there are several organizations that acknowledge the strain of their loved one, you know, caring for their loved one on their own health. Um, and they've shown, you know, evidence has shown that this is really a problem. And we as nurses have this problem. We tend to give and give and give and give, but you can't pour out of an empty cup. You have to be poured into it. Most nurses will feel, myself included, probably you too, Megan, um, that self-care is selfish. Um, it is not selfish. It's actually necessary. You cannot turn around and take care of someone if you yourself are falling apart. And if the thought comes into your head, you know, or the caregiver's head, but if I don't do it, no one else will. But if you're not there, they won't have you. Um, so that's really something to, you know, uh, remember when we're going through that, whether it's seeking support from other people, whether it's taking breaks, whether it's engaging in activities that bring you joy. Um, caregivers specifically, and, and that includes nurses, need to ensure that their own emotional and physical needs are met. And just like we talked in the previous one, that emotional and spiritual needs and how that can cause pain and distress also. So I, I think this is an absolute must in this tool. Absolutely. And once again, for the copy of the Comfort Care Tool, you can go to my website, www.comfortcareexpert.com for your own copy. And we will continue to do podcast episodes to go dig a little bit deeper into all of these components, um, just because they are, they make up the five most common needs nearing end of life. So comfort, airway, restlessness, emotional support, spiritual support, and self-care. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for tuning in to the Comfort Care Expert podcast for nurses. I'm Megan Lefto, reminding you that through understanding and implementing the comfort care tool, we can make a meaningful difference in the lives of those that we're caring for. And In the meantime, stay compassionate, stay informed, and please take care. I think you have to stop. There we go.